Hi, welcome back for today's movie recap. Today, we will recap the movie, Oppenheimer. This movie is about a man named Julius Robert Oppenheimer, an American theoretical physicist who played a role in the development of the atomic bomb. The movie began with J. Robert Oppenheimer, who used to stay in Cambridge to study new physics under a professor named Patrick Blackett. He reminisced about how he couldn't sleep at night due to being homesick and his vision of a new universe. Oppenheimer couldn't even focus in the lab, resulting in his professor reprimanding him. When Oppenheimer saw the apple his professor left on his table, he injected cyanide into it and left, intending on poisoning his professor with it. But then he realized what he'd done and immediately went back to his professor's lab to get the poisoned apple, but then he saw Niels Bohr holding the apple. Niels knew Oppenheimer was not doing well in the lab and advised him to go to the University of Göttingen in Germany to study under Max Born and learn the ways of theory. When Niels was about to bite on the apple, Oppenheimer snatched it out of his and threw it away with the excuse that it already had a wormhole. In court, a man named Louis Strauss was told to say what he knew about Professor Heimer. Strauss stated that he met Oppenheimer in 1947 in his capacity as a board member for advanced study at Princeton. He also stated that Oppenheimer was well known after the war as the greatest physicist, which made him determined to get Oppenheimer to run the institute. When they first met, Strauss welcomed Oppenheimer to the institute and toured him around before bringing him to his office. Through the window, they saw Albert Einstein in the distance, and they talked about the theory of relativity that Albert Einstein had created 40 years earlier. Oppenheimer approached Einstein, and the two conversed for a while before Einstein walked away while Strauss approached Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer warned Strauss about his past, but Strauss cut in, stating that he had already read Oppenheimer's file and still thinks he is the best choice and that their institute provides refuge for independent minds like Oppenheimer. The scene went back to Oppenheimer getting interrogated, and he shared the story of when he went to Leiden, Holland, where he met Isidore Rabi. The two of them talked about physics for a while before Rabi told Oppenheimer about a German named Heisenberg he needed to seek out. They listened to Heisenberg's lesson and approached him when the class was over. Heisenberg offered to work with Oppenheimer, but the latter declined as he needed to go back to America and was only there to meet Heisenberg for a while. Their paths crossed again when Oppenheimer was working at the California Institute of Technology and had another job at the University of California at Berkeley, where he started teaching quantum theory. He met Dr. Lawrence, who was constructing a machine inside the lab, and they introduced themselves to each other. Oppenheimer started his class with just one student, but due to his knowledge and skills in teaching, his class attracted more students. One Saturday, Lawrence stepped into his room and told Oppenheimer not to involve his students in political issues before the two of them left together to eat out. Later that night, Oppenheimer met up with his brother, Frank, and Jackie, Frank's girlfriend. They entered a party where they met the Chevalier. Jackie tried talking to Chevalier, but Oppenheimer cut her off, and she dragged Frank away, leaving Oppenheimer and Chevalier, who were talking about politics. Chevalier asked what Oppenheimer was currently working on, and Oppenheimer replied that he was trying to find out what happens when stars die. Oppenheimer theorized that when stars die, they crumble and explode. And the bigger the star is, the more violent its demise. And when the stars die, the gravity will be so concentrated that it will engulf everything, even the earth. While they were talking, a woman named Jean Tatlock cut in and introduced herself. Chevalier left them after introducing himself to Jean, leaving Oppenheimer and Jean, who later went to have their own party. After their session, Oppenheimer told Jean how he once tried to kill his professor in Cambridge. Jean found a book of Sanskrit and asked Oppenheimer to read it word for word. One day, Oppenheimer was camping in the middle of nowhere with Frank and Lawrence, where they could see the stars clearly. Oppenheimer told Lawrence about his favorite place called Los Alamos, which he wanted to climb the next day. One day at the university, one of Oppenheimer's students, Alvarez, told him the news of Hahn and Strassmann splitting the uranium nucleus in Germany. Oppenheimer learned that they bombarded the atom with neutrons, splitting it. Oppenheimer thought that it was impossible and wrote down his knowledge on the board, trying to prove himself right. But Lawrence came back into the room and told him that Alvarez was in the lab and that he was able to prove that splitting the atom was possible. They learned that during the process, a chain reaction occurred as the other uranium atoms were also split by the emitted neutrons. That was when the idea of creating a bomb came into Oppenheimer's mind. Later that night, Oppenheimer visited Jean, who rejected him by throwing the flowers he bought into the trash. One day when he was talking with Lawrence, Richard and Dr. Bush came into the room, and though they didn't say anything, Oppenheimer seemed to already know what they were there for. He went to his own classroom, where his students congratulated him for his article about the black hole that had already been released. He showed his article to Hartland, who wasn't happy as he, too, showed a newspaper about Hitler invading Poland. Back in the interrogation room, Oppenheimer admitted that the Battle of Britain made him increasingly out of sympathy for the communist policy of neutrality. 
His change of views on Russia did not cut him off from those who thought otherwise. He also admitted that for years, during his marriage with Kitty, he'd been a member of the Communist Party. He met Kitty, who was a biologist turned housewife after getting married, at another party, and he explained what quantum mechanics was to her. Oppenheimer brought Kitty to New Mexico, where the two of them engaged in a kiss. After secretly dating for a while, Oppenheimer knocked Kitty up. Oppenheimer, who was in an on and off relationship with Jean, broke up with the latter, and Kitty divorced her husband so she and Oppenheimer could get married before the baby was born. One day, Lawrence confronted Oppenheimer at the university. Lawrence said that Oppenheimer's actions were the reason why Lawrence wasn't allowed to tell him about a project that Oppenheimer already knew about. Oppenheimer explained that everyone had already heard about Einstein and Szilard warning Roosevelt about the German project and that he knew what it meant for the Nazis to have a bomb. Lawrence told Oppenheimer to stop being naive because someone had been spying on him. Hearing that, Oppenheimer promised to talk with Lomanitz and the others. Back in the courtroom, Strauss stated that Oppenheimer was the most respected physicist in the world, which is why he entrusted the institute to him and why Oppenheimer advised the Atomic Energy Commission. Oppenheimer was visited by Lt. Gen. Lisey Groves, who oversaw the construction of the Pentagon and directed the Manhattan Project. Groves asked Oppenheimer to be involved in the Manhattan Project, the development of the atomic bomb. The project was held in Los Alamos, and Oppenheimer assembled a group of scientists that would help him create the atomic bomb that they would use to save the world. So the group of scientists started discussing how to create the atomic bomb. They met up with Strauss later on, and they caught him up on the project. Strauss was worried that there was a spy at Los Alamos. One of the scientists then backed out of the project after getting reprimanded by General Groves for breaking the rules. Oppenheimer knew that the general only hired him for the project so he could control him, so he requested for his security to be cleared so he could finish the project without further problems. During a meeting, Kenneth Nichols mentioned that their security had been undermined and someone had attempted to breach it. He was suspicious of Jean Tatlock, whom Oppenheimer had been secretly meeting. Strauss, who had a personal agenda against Oppenheimer, used this against Oppenheimer so the latter would lose the hearing. Hearing of his infidelity, Kitty left right after the interrogation was over. One night, Oppenheimer was talking with Bohr, who told him that they had to make the politicians understand that the atomic bomb wasn't just a new weapon but a new world, and Oppenheimer was the man who'd give them the power to destroy themselves. A woman then cut in on their conversation, telling Oppenheimer about a call they received from San Francisco. He found out that Jean had committed suicide and blamed himself for her death. During a meeting, Oppenheimer was sitting quietly while the others were arguing. Hans Bethe called Teller out for not helping, and Teller stated that he was engaged in research, which the other refuted. Upset, Teller walked out, refusing to work with Beta. Hans agreed for Teller to leave Alamos, and that's when Oppenheimer stood up, telling everyone that no one was leaving Alamos before following Teller to convince him to stay, but the latter just left without saying anything more to him. During another meeting, everyone was discussing creating a hydrogen bomb, which has the potential to be a thousand times more powerful than an atomic bomb. The others asked for Oppenheimer's opinion, and he disagreed with creating an H-bomb because the Russians would have no choice but to build their own. Strauss disagreed with his opinion and stated that the Russians might have started creating their own hydrogen bomb with the help of the information they gathered through the spy. Oppenheimer insisted that there was no spy in Los Alamos before stating that they should extract concessions from the Russians by promising that they would not develop a hydrogen bomb. Seeing that Oppenheimer and Strauss were starting to fight, Bush decided to end the meeting. In the trial, Strauss was questioned by the senator if he accused Oppenheimer of sabotaging the development of the supercomputer. As said by a man named William Borden, the senator also questioned how Borden was able to come up with a detailed indictment as if he had unlimited access to Oppenheimer's file when he was no longer a civil servant. Strauss didn't answer the questions but just stated that it was a serious accusation being dropped on him. Meanwhile, Teller was being questioned if he believed Oppenheimer was disloyal to the United States, and Teller replied that he'd still believe Oppenheimer was loyal to the US unless proven otherwise. Oppenheimer saw a meeting between some of the scientists who began questioning the purpose of the atomic bomb due to the Germans surrendering after Hitler's death. Oppenheimer told them that Hitler may have died, but the Japanese are still resisting. He promised that they could end the war, and their work in Los Alamos would ensure unprecedented peace for mankind. The Trinity test was then carried out despite the risk of possibly triggering a chain reaction that could perhaps bring about the end of the world. The Trinity test was successful, and US President Truman decided to drop the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan. Oppenheimer couldn't make up his mind. While the Americans were celebrating, Oppenheimer was remorseful. Everyone was applauding him for successfully leading the Manhattan Project, but he couldn't even smile genuinely.
He felt proud of what they accomplished but also guilty about the mass deaths inflicted on Japan. The US President, Truman, who saw the emotional state Oppenheimer was in, was disgusted, as he perceived Oppenheimer's guilt as weakness. Truman made sure that Oppenheimer was set free from his responsibilities for the bombings, but Oppenheimer refused. He decided to hold himself accountable, as he was the one who created the weapon used to send devastation to Japan. After the bombings, Oppenheimer became a vocal advocate against nuclear development. However, given the heated context of the Cold War with the Soviet Union, his position becomes a source of dispute. The government became suspicious of Oppenheimer due to his alleged affiliation with the left wing and his affair with Jean Tatla, who was a member of the Communist Party of the United States of America. Strauss used these allegations to his advantage and devised a plan to destroy Oppenheimer's credibility so that the latter's security clearance would be revoked. He wanted Oppenheimer to go through a trial in a small, shabby room away from the spotlight and through a simple administrative procedure. He told William Borden to send his accusations to the FBI, and then FBI Director Hoover would send them to the AEC. Meanwhile, Nichols would inform Oppenheimer that his clearance had been revoked. Once Oppenheimer appealed, Strauss would then appoint a board with Roger Robb as the prosecutor. It would be a closed hearing, so there would be no audience, reporters, or proof that would be used against them. This plan was successful, and Oppenheimer was removed from political influence. However, Strauss' plan soon backfired on him when David Hill testified against him. David Hill also revealed Strauss' personal agenda against Oppenheimer, proving that Oppenheimer was put through an ordeal only because he expressed his honest opinions, and Strauss hated him for that. After losing the trial against him, Strauss was denied a cabinet position by the Senate, and Oppenheimer's reputation was cleared. In the epilogue scene, we see Oppenheimer and Albert Einstein talking. Einstein told Oppenheimer that it was his turn to face the consequences of his achievements. And that one day, once Oppenheimer had been punished enough, everyone would congratulate him, and all would be forgiven. But the forgiveness wouldn't be for Oppenheimer, but for everyone else. That was when Oppenheimer realized that they had already triggered the chain reaction they were fearing. In the last scenes, fire was seen across the surface of the planet, and a ring of fire consumed the Earth. We see a close-up view of Oppenheimer closing his eyes after he was hit by realizations. 